The wildest parts of nature fill us with wonder. But sometimes their majestic beauty can be deceptively deadly. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of swift actions and kind hearts on Rescue 911. We begin on May 1st, 1986, as a group of travelers were enjoying a five-day canoe safari through the remote jungle of Zimbabwe, Africa. The plan was to paddle an 80-mile stretch of the Zambezi River. Their guide, Simon Silcock, had led more than 50 expeditions in the area. The Zambezi runs through two fantastic game parks, and they are both totally virginal bush. It is not unusual to camp and actually to have an elephant come and put his trunk inside your tent. Okay, guys, let's get the boats in order. 19-year-old Rupert Novus was on a year-long trip through Africa after finishing college back home in England. There was nothing difficult about the actual canoeing itself. It required a quick one-minute lesson from Simon when we got in for those particular canoes, and then after that, away we went. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this looks lovely. We were going through the middle of nowhere. It was gorgeous. Kenyan-born Alexander Shaw was sharing a canoe with Rupert, his good friend from school. The hippos were basically the main, the main danger. So it was very much a question of uh, trying to steer clear of them. Yeah, in front. The we did see some crocs, but they weren't any danger to us because they'd run a mile as soon as we canoed anywhere near them. During dusk, and as the sun's going down, you get all the river noises. It was great. It was an orchestra in itself. On their fifth and final day on the water, they still had four hours of paddling ahead of them. It's it was a very, very wide bit of the river, and it was baking hot. The water's lovely. We'd all drift together, and I got to know Hugh better and, and Jeremy, and had a good time with them. South African Hugh Lloyd and his 13-year-old son Jeremy were two of the other travelers on the safari. We did swim to cool off one or two times a day, but the places were carefully chosen. Uh, we all need a swim, but we can't take a chance here. The water would have to be very, very clear and shallow enough to see your toenails. Swimming in deep water in the Zambezi is absolutely crazy. It's the same as swimming in shark-infested water. It had rained a lot and turned the water very brown. Hey, Simon, can we please go for a swim? The water's shallow. It was only at 3 o'clock that I found a place that I considered to be safe enough. Okay, guys, we're okay. We can stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. This way. Hey. Right, it's uh, Simon. Right, Simon. <laughs> yeah, Jamie. It was very, very relaxing. And we slowly drifted down the river with the canoes. As we floated, it started to get a little bit deeper. The guide suggested that we should get back into the canoes. Right. I'll go with you later. All right. Yes. Okay. He's on the back in the boat. Hey, Jeremy suddenly just disappeared, uh, like a fishing float going down. The water was calm on top. We didn't know what had happened to him at all. Get him! Before we could get there, he was pulled back underneath. We then realised that there was something very, very badly wrong. When we continued, we couldn't see what was going on underneath. We were just feeling around with our arms.
On a canoe safari in the African jungle, 13-year-old Jeremy Lloyd was attacked by a 12-foot crocodile while swimming in the Zambezi River. Another member of his group, Rupert Novus, had been close by when he saw the boy disappear from view. He didn't scream. He didn't have time to. I was a bit confused as to what was happening. Was it a game? Was someone having a water fight? I couldn't see what was going on underneath. We were just feeling around with our arms. Alex then got pulled underneath. I've located Jeremy and I just pulled up as, as hard as I could. Fortunately, he was released. The swirling had continued and it had become more and more red. It was obvious that it was a crocodile, there was nothing else, it could be, but I hadn't seen it. I could feel the crocodile between our legs. We all just frantic to get out of the water. This was the first time I got a proper sight of Hugh's arm. It had been bitten off from the elbow downwards. We started to sink back into the water. I knew that I had to do something about it. It's probably the fastest I've ever swum in my life. Alex has had his arm very badly broken. I had teeth marks all around my wrist. But the whole incident had focused around Jeremy, and the, and the very fact that he was alive was the saving grace of it. Anything after that was, was, was small fry. Our major concern was the likelihood of them dying from loss of blood. It's an awful feeling knowing that you are 150 miles with no road from any hospital. Hugh's arm was obviously the most serious, but he acted with incredible calmness. He was totally handling the situation. Get some pressure pads on him. He was quite extraordinary. His mental condition was, was fantastic, but it wasn't going to keep his, his physical situation going. Hey, Jeremy. Jeremy had been bitten on his arm, which was looking quite mangled. He said, just somebody tell me this is a nightmare. It, it was the most heart-wrenching thing that you couldn't tell the guy what he wanted to hear. The nearest help was at the Monopools Game Preserve Station, five miles away through the bush. We knew that we had to somehow get the injured down to there, but we didn't know how we were going to do that. I saw a white thing on the shore directly opposite us. Look across there on the other bank. I was thinking, white is man-made. There's nothing white in the bush. Is that a car? That's a car. That's a car. It was indeed a Land Rover. It was a very fortunate set of circumstances because it was the first day that people had been allowed into the parks uh, for six months. You come down and help us. We were very concerned because we were a long way away from being able to get proper help. We didn't necessarily have that sort of time to play with. Because there was no medical facility anywhere near, Jeremy and his father were taken to Mana Pools, where they could radio for help. Rupert stayed behind with his injured friend Alex to wait for the next trip. That's sort of stuff because this. Simon! Gordon, we need help here. We've got two people taken by a crook. Okay, I'll try and get a plane. We've got Simon, is it I'm a doctor? There happened to be a doctor who was signing in to come on a camping trip. Now, I've been happy to see people in my life before, but that guy I was delighted to see. Simon, we've got a plane. It's going to be here in about 20 minutes. He put saline drips into both of them. Hugh Lloyd was weakening. 
he was going white. I think shock was probably setting in. And Jeremy had gone very, very quiet, which is always a bad sign. A bush pilot who'd heard about their situation volunteered to pick up the wounded at a nearby clearing for transport to the hospital. Hugh and I actually ended up crying the rest of the way, quite honestly. I remember him saying, I'm, I'm sorry this has happened, I'm sorry this has happened. But of course I've had to live with a certain amount of guilt because it should never have happened. Hugh Lloyd and his 13-year-old son Jeremy were flown 300 miles to the capital city of Harare, where they underwent surgery at Parapanitwa Hospital. Gillian Lloyd could not get a visa to come and see her husband and son until two days later. By the time I saw him, Hugh was a lot stronger. But Jeremy was running a dangerously high temperature, and he was in a great deal of pain. The orthopedic specialist had said that I had to try and picture a bag of confetti, and that that's what the bones in Jeremy's arm looked like because the crocodile had chewed it to tiny little fragments. After 10 days, Jeremy and his father were transferred to Morningside Hospital in their hometown of Johannesburg, South Africa, where they underwent further surgery. What sort of use will he have? Dr. Diamond said that I was to be prepared for the fact that Jeremy would never move his arm more than two degrees either way. It was completely and utterly fixed in a right angle. And it reconstructed the joint. I was just extremely grateful that I still had a son. The fact that they had both been so brutally damaged was traumatic, but I was just very grateful that they were still alive. Seven years have passed since the incident. Jeremy and Hugh have long since learned to cope with their physical limitations. You sunk it in for five. It's not so good. Remember the first most difficult thing to do was learning how to pull your trousers up without them falling down. And then how do you wrap a bath towel around you after you've been in a shower? When I kind of finally accepted that I was the one on person, not the two armed person of one arm missing. <laughs> I quickly learned that I could do everything I'd ever done. For quite a while, my whole life became centered around my arm, which is very annoying. And I was getting frustrated because I was thinking this damn arm just, it just won't move. No. He used to spend hours at the physiotherapist, despite tremendous pain. And he now can extend the arm more than 80 degrees. Yeah. Cool. You can't it's on, it's on, it's on. When I was taken, I didn't even know it was a crocodile. The water was just rushing past me. There's no, there's no way I could breathe. But by that time, my father was next to it. And he punched it to make it let me go. If it hadn't been for him, then I would have died. I have no regrets. Absolutely none whatsoever. That's the only thing I could have done. It wasn't a matter of choice. Oh, amazing. Hey, look at them. Over there. Alex and, and, and Rupert could easily have made sure of their own safety, and they didn't. They stayed, and they helped, which demanded enormous bravery and enormous courage. I lived in that country for most of my life, and most people who are taken by a crocodile are never seen again. Look at zebra and goodies over there. It certainly does teach a lesson, but a lesson that has been learned before, which is that you have to treat nature with extreme caution and utmost respect. I'm grateful for the fact that at the end of the day, we're all here and uh, we're all alive to be able to talk about it. It's quite amazing.